Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of it. You have all had a wonderful first week back in Oxford. Tonight, we welcome Prime Minister Mathahir of Malaysia to the Oxford Union. At 93 years of age, Prime Minister Mathahir is one of the oldest heads of state in the world and Malaysia's longest serving Prime Minister, with a political career spanning over 70 years. He's the first Malaysian Prime Minister not to represent the Parisian National Coalition and to serve from two different parties and in non consecutive terms. He has overseen rapid modernisation and economic growth in Malaysia, but has been heavily criticised for his approach towards religious minorities and civil liberties. I hope you'll make the most of this opportunity tonight to hear from Prime Minister Mathahir and ask him questions. And with that, please join me in welcoming the Prime Minister of Malaysia. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, firstly I would like to say thank you to Oxford Union for inviting me to speak to this uh, very important audience. Firstly, I would like to say something about my own country, Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia, at independence, chose to be, chose to a democratic system of government. And for 60 over years, the system worked quite well. But we also found a lot of weaknesses in the system. It is possible, for example, for leaders who are elected to abuse their position, especially the prime minister, and reduce that democracy of ours into a kind of dictatorship. Now, this happened uh, quite some time ago, but uh, it is uh, something that was not expected, uh, which happened with the 14th uh, general election. On the 9th of May, the single party, which had ruled the country for 60 over years, lost to the opposition. This has never happened before. And the people were so keen to see a change in the government that despite all efforts by the government of that time to stop people from voting for the opposition parties, uh, the opposition won with a clear majority. This is unprecedented. It had never happened in Malaysia because from the time of our independence, we had only one government. Different leaders, of course. There were altogether six leaders by the time we had our 14th general election. But at the 14th general election, for the first time, the people showed that they wanted a change of government. Uh, some people may say that uh, this one party uh, running the country for 60 years cannot be democratic. I would like to say that it is not so democratic as compared to countries like uh, those in Europe, like here, the United Kingdom, America and the rest. But what happens is that despite certain uh, deficiencies, uh, the party won the elections repeatedly and there were no serious accusation that the, the government or the government party had fiddled with the election system. But this time it is different. The people really wanted to change the government. They were afraid because Malaysians are very timid people. They don't take to the streets easily. 
surely they don't show any uh, tendency towards violence. So they suffered, suffered in silence, but they felt the uh, oppression quite uh, as strongly as uh, other people would when they demonstrate in the streets or go on strike. But uh, the, during the election, there was still no expectation that the government party would be losing the election. But on the 9th of May, or rather 10th of May of last year, it soon became clear that the government party, despite manipulations, had lost to the opposition uh, coalition or opposition parties. It took a bit of time for the government to admit that it has lost. Indeed, uh, it influenced the uh, election commission not to announce the winners from the opposition, but to announce only the winners from the government party. So initially, we could see that uh, the government party was again winning. But towards the end, uh, when they ran short of winners, they had to announce that there were opposition winners also, and that their numbers exceed that of the, of the government party. But the announcement did not take place until about 2 in the morning, because by then, the attempt to set up a different coalition government had failed. And Malaysia had the first change of government in its uh, history since independence. Now, as you can see, even elected uh, leaders or prime ministers can abuse his power to the extent that people became very scared of him, were afraid of him. Even when he abuses the laws of the country, uh, still there were no outright demonstration of uh, disapproval by the people. That was that government at that time. And now, of course, the, the opposition coalition has taken power and is trying to bring back all the democratic features of an independent democratic country. We are reducing the power of the prime minister by transferring it more to the parliament uh, than to the prime minister so that he will not, uh, people will not feel obliged to support him. Beyond that, of course, we are reinstalling the rule of law, which is very important. It was ignored during the previous government. But uh, in the end, uh, the election system proved that Malaysia is democratic. Many people would dispute what I say because many people think that Malaysia is not very democratic. But I would like to tell you that since independence, it has held 14 elections and there was not much uh, complaints about the elections except <coughs> the last one. So in terms of the people selecting their leaders, uh, Malaysia has proven that it is uh, democratic to that extent. Maybe there are certain things which, are, which do not seem to be democratic enough. For example, we inherited a law from our colonial masters called the ISA. The, it is about security of the country and it gives power to the government and the Prime Minister, of course, the right to arrest people without trial. That is, of course, something that nobody likes these days because it is very undemocratic. But even in a democracy, uh, a leader like the previous government leader was able to abuse the laws of the country and rule the country more or less as a dictatorship. 
Now, when I see this, I'm reminded, of course, that I myself was a prime minister who was accused of being a dictator. Because many people believe that I was a dictator. How else could he govern the country except by being a dictator? I just would like to point out that in the history of nations, there has not been a single dictator who stepped down while he was in power and allowed others to take over from him. Dictators don't usually resign or retire. They like to be dictators until the day of the, their death. So, to that extent, we claim that Malaysia is a democracy. But democracy can be man manipulated in many ways. And man democracy is very difficult to work. Uh, it's so complex. So many people have freedom and they can do what they like, say what they like. And this uh, is not something that uh, strong people tolerate. But democracy is good in the sense that it allows people to choose their own government. To that extent, democracy has uh, proven to be the right form of government. But we see attempts now to force democracy on all the countries in the world. Democrats have now become very intolerant of other systems. They want to abolish other systems of government to the point where if you don't change, you don't become a democracy, you are not democratic, your country will be invaded in order to put in a new leader. That, I think, is co completely against the concept or the idea of democracy. Democracy should not be forced upon people. People should make their own choices. And the other powers should not uh, threaten to, to do something to ensure that the leader is democratic. The act of forcing countries to become democratic is in itself undemocratic. But this is what has happened now because Democrats have become very intolerant to the extent that they are prepared to go to war, to kill people, to destroy whole countries if these countries do not embrace democracy. So that is why I believe that democracy can only exist and help the country to prosper if people understand what democracy is all about. We think that people understand that the majority should rule. But to achieve majority, you have to have elections. And the losers do not feel happy about losing. They would like uh, themselves to win. And so when they lose, they disrupt the whole country. They go to the streets and have demonstrations. In some cases, it ends up with civil war even. Because the losers, if, even if they are democratic, do not want to accept losing an election. They feel that uh, it was not right just because people put a tick in a square area, therefore they would not become the government. And so what we see today is what is known as the Arab Spring. I don't think the Arabs regarded it as their spring, but outsiders call it the Arab Spring. At that time, everybody feels that when the Arabs become democratic, then of course they will be doing just as well as the old democracies. But the facts have shown that when they embrace democracy and try to practice it, they, they got into a lot of trouble. We see what's happening in Syria, for example. The attempt to overthrow the dictatorial government has resulted in war, uh, war between the people within the Syria itself, and we see people running away by the millions from their own country because 
they feel that uh, they would be uh, better off outside of Syria. On the other hand, we find that uh, the, during the time of the authoritarian government, not, may, not so many people will be killed because of disputes or, or anything else. It is true, perhaps, that some people will be thrown to jail without trial, would even be tortured, but the number of deaths is far less than what we see in the attempt to impose democracy on the country. Uh, we see a lot of wars being fought, people being killed and injured, and the whole country devastated. So while we think that democracy is the best form of government, we have to remember that these people are not familiar with the system. They have had autocratic government for, for centuries, but to turn them into democracies overnight is something that is very disruptive and can result in wars. Democrats must always remember that it took a long time for democracy to be accepted and practiced by any country. It took almost 200 years for democracy to be practiced in this country. They, were, they had time to enunciate what democracy is all about and to practice it in stages. Of course, in England, for example, in the early phase, only landlords were allowed to vote. Others were not allowed to vote. It took a long time before women were allowed to vote. And then it took a much longer time for other categories of people to gain the right to vote for their government. So the time taken permits the people to adjust themselves to this new idea that a tick in a square is sufficient for a government to be overthrown. It takes a long time and this time is not given to the new uh, democracies in the Arab countries. Overnight, they had to change from a, dictat um, a dictatorial kind of government to this new form of democracy. We see, for example, the overthrow of dictators. The people were united in wanting to overthrow the dictators. But once the dictator is overthrown, then the people who overthrew the dictator now begins to quarrel among themselves as, who, as to who has the right to rule. Or you may have elections, but of course, the losers invariably dispute the results of the election. So now what we see is turmoil instead of democracy in this country. I believe that democracy is a very good system, but people must be given time to adjust to the democratic system. They have to be, learn to be patient. They have also to learn that in a democracy, not all parties can win. Somebody must lose if somebody is going to win. And the losers must accept that they have lost and therefore they have to wait until the next election before trying again. But we, what we see is that when they lose the election, invariably they would accuse the winners of uh, cheating or fraud, etc. And we refuse to accept the winning party as the government. So because of that, they, you see a lot of turmoil in these new democracies because they are not used to the system and they cannot understand why somebody's uh, little mark on a piece of paper could result in their being defeated. So that is the situation that we see today uh, in many new countries trying to adopt the system, the democratic system. But Malaysia has been very fortunate in that the transition from being a colony, colonial, 
a colony to uh, an independent independent country is uh, is uh, smooth. Uh, Malaysians did not, did not fight for independence. We negotiated our independence, and because we did not fight and we negotiated, then the people who are most capable of governing uh, took over power in Malaysia, and with that. Uh, the country was able to be ruled uh, after the after the defeat or the after the colonial colonial powers were ousted. The people could took, could take over the, the uh, government and were able to help rule the country and develop the country. This is what we have in Malaysia today, and we hope that uh, this idea that a short stroke on a piece of paper will determine who governs the country must be understood and accepted by the people in Malaysia. Currently, some people are still unable to accept the concept. They are strongly attached to their leaders to the point where they will not do anything even when the leaders leader does a lot of wrong things. They continue to support, not because the government was good, but because uh, they, they are attached to the leader of their choice. So when you have this strong uh, type of uh, obedience towards a leader, then democracy can actually be uh, sideline and uh, push aside so that uh, a dictatorship would result. This is what happened in Malaysia. So we have had an experience, you know, I have had the experience of winning, of losing, of winning without <coughs> any contest and also of winning many elections. But uh, instead of leading the party, uh, that I was, uh, uh, that made me the Prime Minister for 22 years, I am now the leader of the opposition to the very party that I led. Yeah, this is, of course, uh, quite funny because, <laughs> because uh, they used to call me a dictator and other nasty names. Uh, and yet, uh, when I left my old party, they accepted me and named me as the, uh, the, the next Prime Minister the, and not one of their own men to take over from, uh, from the government party if we should win. But uh, it, it, I don't know what it means uh, to them, but uh, they somehow or other, the opposition party somehow or other, they, realized that uh, maybe what they said about me was not quite right. <laughs> I think so. But uh, we nevertheless have learned to work together. Uh, we are still in the process of teaching people about democracy. Democracy is about choosing leaders to govern the country. It's not about putting your, your relative or friend uh, up as candidate because then you can access him very easily. Uh, in Malaysia, it, I was accused of cronyism because a lot of people did very well during the time, 22 years I was a prime minister. Uh, it seems that because people did well, it must be because he is favored by, <laughs> by the prime minister. The fact is that uh, everybody gets a chance and if he is good enough, he will succeed. But uh, the feeling of uh, people at that time when I was Prime Minister was that anybody who succeeds must be because he is a crony of the Prime Minister. So what I had to do if I don't want to be accused of cronyism is to ensure that nobody succeeds in Malaysia. <laughs> When nobody succeeds, then I, they will say, I had no cronies. But then, of course, 
they will also comment about the country not being developed. Uh, but in order to develop, you have to depend upon people, but actually the private sector, because they are the ones who create wealth in the country. So during my time, when I was uh, prime minister, it's not because I was a dictator. It was because of the need to develop the country, to enrich the country. And governments are not good at enriching the country. Governments are good at collecting taxes. But if the people are poor, who, who are they going to tax? So we must enrich the people first and make them uh, make their businesses prof profitable, then they would have to pay uh, corporate tax and in income tax. That is where the government gets the money. So when the government works with the private sector, it doesn't mean that uh, it is a form of cronism. It is a way in order to, to way, a, way, a way to enrich people to help create wealth for the government to tax. Uh, the government is doing the best business possible. They don't have to invest even a single cent. The private sector will invest millions and billions. When the private sector makes money, 24% of that money belongs to the government. That is, I think, good business. You don't have to invest even a single cent, and yet you can make more money than the private sector. That is how I see government in Malaysia. We work very well with the private sector under a concept called Malaysia Incorporated. And because of that, Malaysia has prospered to the point of uh, being called an Asian tiger. I think it was a small tiger, not a very big tiger. <laughs> but we, we became uh, uh, quite uh, well off because of the so-called cronism practice by the Prime Minister. So I would like to rest there. <laughs>